Okay. Good morning, sir. Can you tell me your name and uh, rank you were retired with? Yes, uh, my name is Chuck Meadows, and I retired as a colonel in the Marines. What was your final assignment, and where are you residing now? My final assignment on active duty was back at Headquarters Marine Corps back in Washington, D.C. and residing now uh, on Bainbridge Island, state of Washington. How old were you when you became a Marine and how did you become a Marine officer? Well, I was uh, 22 years old. Um, I was commissioned through the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps, NROTC unit. Uh, and attended that at my alma mater, which is Oregon State University. So I was commissioned through that program. And how did you become an officer? Well, the, upon that graduation, you are commissioned. At that end of that four years, you become a, you were commissioned as a, in my case, second lieutenant. When would you told in 1965 that you would be Uh, in 1965, I was a first lieutenant. We were stationed with the 1st Marine Brigade in Kaneohe, Hawaii. And when the, our unit, which was the 1st Marine Brigade, was deployed. So we had an infantry regiment, artillery, um, battalions, um, and such. We were told we were getting deployed, and we got aboard ships in uh, Pearl Harbor. And we took a boat and we floated out to Okinawa. And we spent uh, about another month in Okinawa doing some pre-training. And that's where we would have gotten some uh, you know, lectures on the country, where we're going, what to expect, as minimal as those were. And then we boarded ships again and we floated off in the South China Sea for a couple of weeks and then we uh, entered into Vietnam. You were answering my uh, next question about training. Um, and I want to get a little bit more detail about it. What, try, uh, what type of uh, historical or culture training did you and your uh, troops have when you joined Vietnam? Um, uh, uh, we did get some training, but in reflection on that, it was very, very minimal and very cursory. So we didn't understand that country. We cer certainly didn't understand the, uh, the culture. We didn't understand the religion. Uh, we got more training, I'd say, on the current VC tactics, because that's what we were going to be doing. Uh, in overall, yes, we got some training. But again, in reflection, it was not to the level or depth I would certainly hope we do now. Uh, do you have any mission statement, and what do you focus on going there? Uh, our, our mission of the unit I was with at that time was the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment. Well, our mission was to secure uh, the beach and the surrounding areas in Chulai, which is uh, below Da Nang. And the purpose of the infantry was to provide the physical perimeter security of that area so that the Navy you know, CBs and engineers could construct an airfield. And that was going to be the forward airfield. Uh, and so that was our mission. Um, How would you feel when you first land into Vietnam? Well, you can imagine that we were fairly pumped up for that. and. Uh, and anticipation of going in, anticipation of your first, quote, combat role. Um, so we were, the troops, we had them, we were all pumped up to do that. But interestingly, the, the rules of engagement at that time, our weapons were not loaded. Uh, we could not have our magazines inserted in our weapons. But the reality was it was a totally unopposed landing. And we had, you know, people with flowers to greet you, and the, the senior officers that had been in Vietnam were there. And so it was totally unopposed. But emotionally, we were 
we were uh, really pumped up to do what we needed to do there. Was you married at that time? Yes, I was. Uh, I was married. We had one daughter. Um, and that was the second time. So that we had we had one little girl. Yeah. How was your family reaction when they know that you sent to go Well, uh, at that time we were living on the base in Kaneohe on the Marine Corps Air Station there. And so my wife uh, had a good support system, particularly with all the other wives. Now, they all knew where we were going. You could read about it in the newspapers, that sort of thing. And so there was a lot of uh, anxiety for them, certainly. But uh, they were OK. Um, how about your friend and your extended family? Did they well, uh, yes, the, the, they knew what my occupation was. They knew I was a Marine. They knew that you could read in the papers and see they're deploying Marines in, in a buildup uh, in 1965. And so they knew I was going there. But like everyone else, we didn't know what was there. We didn't know what was going on. My father was a... Uh, had been in World War II in Korea. He was an Army Air Corps Air Force pilot. And so we'd been through that before, my mother. Um, my brother was active duty Navy, so he we all knew what was going on. And at that time, most of our friends had were other uh, Marine officers and other Marines where we lived. So everybody was aware of what we were doing, but uh, even us, we didn't have any prior experience to compare that to. I think the question is related to that. And uh, what would you told to expect when you come to a shore? You know, it's like what you were thinking in your mind. Well, we we were we were told that uh, there were uh, uh, Viet Cong, the VC, were in that general area. We were told that it was not going to be uh, opposed, but like everything else, well, we really don't know 100% sure. Uh, so that keeps you mentally pumped up for that sort of thing. Uh, but we, ha we knew what our mission statements were. We knew where we were supposed to go. Um, so all of that became, for a military guy, that's routine. That's what we did. I was well trained. I knew what we were doing, uh, and at that time I was the rifle company commander. He was the first lieutenant, so we we were well trained in our skill sets. Yeah. Uh, so, what would the story, or what would the, uh, you know, what would your platoon talking about when you all get there, and what would? The yeah. Well, I think. Uh, as I said, I was a rifle company commander, and I think our guys and the platoon commanders and such would uh, have talked much the same thing. It's it's the anxiety of getting there. Um, I can't say that we were really disappointed that we didn't have a, a defended beach to storm, that sort of thing, once you got there. Um, so we, we, most of the stuff you talked about was how do we get along during that day? What are your orders for that moment? Uh, are we going to get chow for the troops, you know, water? All, all those just everyday living kind of things became more of the focus of what we were, would have been talking about, I think. Uh, have you got a chance to contact the Vietnamese people and uh, what if so? Um, on our initial landing and such, um, we knew there, Chulai, there's a lot of fishing villages, and that was the occupation of most of farmers and fishermen. Uh, we did get, I did have to go through some of their little villages, but our contact with the people was very limited, very limited. And we have no language skills. We didn't have interpreters. So we, we really couldn't chat. Um, and we had no reason or need at that start to be involved in the villages. Our areas that we went to were 
outside of any village areas though that there are trails and places that needed to walk people to get to work would walk through the area but our contact with the vietnamese people initially very very limited Well, uh, part of that was to provide security for the, the local population also. Because uh, the thinking then was that the Viet Cong, the VC were there, was the quote enemy. And th we know that they operated in and out of that area. But typically they operated at night and we operated in the daytime. And I've always uh, reflected on the, the villagers and the, 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 the civilians, if you will. They were caught in between this stuff. And I don't think they really cared one way or the other as long as nobody disturbed their family life, their kids, their Okay. One, uh, in the last um, conversation with you, you were talking about you land in July and there was cemetery there. And then you said you were not train uh, much about the culture of the country. Can you elaborate about that story? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, most of our training was dealt with the military matters and the mission we were on. And we didn't really get any training as far as uh, some of the other cultural aspects. Now, I'm sure I was told that Vietnamese mainly Buddhist country. Okay, well, what does that mean? They didn't get to the thing, well, in the cemeteries, as an example, what do their tombs look like? Well, I had no idea. And we, first day out, we went through this area, and here are these tombs, if you will, but they're strange looking, mostly cement or cinder block, but cement structures that had no idea what they were. Now, in my case, fortunately, my uh, company gunnery sergeant had, was a veteran from Korea, fought in Korea, so he knew what those were. But again, for most of us, we had no clue. And so our typical culture would say, well, you kind of respect cemetery areas let's not run the tractors right through the things so but we should have known that beforehand you'd think but that was part of a strange land strange people strange custom strange language that all of those we had to learn and most of that we learned kind of on the fly as as we would experience it how you and with your troops uh, supported and then did you yeah, yeah. Well, when we landed, yes, uh, our meals and our logistic support was what you carry on your back. And so we would land with probably a day or so of, of rations. And we, in those days, we did eat sea rations. Um, because we, we landed from a rather large amphibious force, with a lot of ships at sea, so there were a lot of resupply, so resupply was easy. The most needed part of that for where we were was water. Chulai is like a, it's not a desert, it's sandy, but very, very hot. And there's no water that we, the Americans, could drink. It wasn't clean. We used uh, uh, water purification pills and that sort of thing. But still, water became a big issue. Uh, but our resupply was pretty routine, actually. It, was, it wasn't that hard. But we just didn't have hot meals. There wasn't a base yet established where you could bring the folks in to cook and that sort of thing. When I say Sira for Norm American, they don't know what it means. Can you explain the sea rats? Oh, sea rations. Um, well, the sea rations and most that we ate were, came in little uh, tin cans, little cans. Uh, and, with, you know, you had P5, what we used to open them, the can openers. Uh, and then you could heat them in there, but that was the main meal we had. And they, we had a, a variety of different meals, and they'd get some that had some bread. We had some fruit, and those, but it was all in a can. And in those days, those were a little heavy. You just don't 
have eight of those. So you couldn't carry that many days ration. And so for us, you only ate at best two times a day because it was difficult to resupply. It was difficult just to carry that much uh, food with you. Uh, actually, uh, yes. They're, you know, you can put them in the cans. They can stay around for a long, long while. Now, again, just think, we were there in 1965. So some of the rations we got would have been made in 1955. So some of them were 10 years old, but that wasn't, uh, and, and typically, you got to use up the old stuff before you get the new stuff. How would you taste? Um, it, they were fine. The only ones that were not so good were the chocolate bars because they were, got old and they became very brittle. But uh, in general, all the, the other stuff was okay. Put it that way. Would you think that they had enough Marines to cover the area in July when it was war? I mean, just yes, when we landed, we landed with probably uh, 3,000 men, something like that. But July, as it started, we expanded out, and that was still a large area. But we had quite sufficient uh, forces to do what we were assigned to do there. Yeah. My next question would be, if it was in June 65, and the US forces were able to be used anywhere in Vietnam, if it would be advantageous to search and destroy what the new US policy did, that have Yes, uh, again, for us, where we were initially was to secure the area, same in Da Nang. And once we could get that established and get base camps and such, then we would start uh, being able to maneuver and patrol and go outside our perimeter area. That would have been termed that search and destroy. Um, so we got involved with that, yes, after I'd say, say a month. We got the things in and we had all the other support in that we could send out small patrols out to the front. We didn't go but a couple of miles maybe. Um, and we had very um, minimal contact because again, we're fighting VC and the VC lived up in the jungle areas. We were down more on the flat sides. Uh, but we, we had some minimal contact. Did you have any, are you post uh, at, at Chulai, no. We, there were no uh, South Vietnamese forces that we had. I know they provided uh, liaison folks and would have provided some of the interpreters for us. Uh, the the Arvind for forces were a little bit north of where we were, but in our units we did not have any uh, major activity at that time and we, we were not uh, uh, fighting or if you will, even doing operations with any of the uh, South Vietnamese army, no. In your first time, you didn't uh, get into a big battle or anything like that? No, uh, not initially. The big first big battle there was uh, called Operation Starlight. Uh, and that, and that one took place after I had left. So personally, no, I didn't get involved with that. My company did, and our battalion did. But that was the very first, what you would call really an operation, and that was fairly significant, yeah. When was it? What year was it? That was 1965. I think it was something like September or somewhere in there, but in, in 1965. So your first uh, trip was short? Yes, my first time was short because w when we joined the unit in Hawaii, my unit, I'd been with them for three years. And uh, typically then, um, I don't think anyone had a clue as to how long we would be in Vietnam. And so when we first started, uh, uh, a lot of the folks that we came over with, when their normal tour with that unit was up, we went home. And so the first groups of guys did there may or may not have stayed the whole most of them didn't, of the initial landing. I believe you got sent the second tour and when was it? Yeah, in the second tour, uh, I went back in 19, 
67 and into 1968. And as a matter of fact, I had been stationed just at the other end of this water down at uh, Bremerton, at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. We had a marine barracks there. And I'd been assigned back to here. And uh, so I got my orders uh, while I was there to come back. I'd been there about 18 months and then return. Um, did you get trained uh, before you deployed the second tour? Yeah, the second tour, um, they had uh, pre-deployment trains, what it was called. Pre-deployment training at Camp Pendleton in California, Marine Camp. And that was generally about 30 days of training which uh, was to get people you know, acclimated a little. Uh, we, we did some tactical training in companies in the field. And some of that was some of the, again, cultural training, talking about that. But again, to the level of really understanding was still not there. It, re it wasn't. Um, so much of that was really dedicated just survival training so that that young Marine that was going there would feel better about it. We did some shooting marksmanship training, recall through weapon systems, see the different kind of weapon systems. Uh, but that was more than we had the first time. So that pre-deployment training became fairly standard. Uh, during the second trip into Vietnam, you got into big battlefield and what, what was it and how did you Yes, when I, when I got back to, to Vietnam, I had first been assigned in Okinawa and uh, had gone back in the country uh, when we first uh, uh, sent units to Quezon, as a matter of fact. And then I got sent back in, uh, what would have been, November, I think, of 67. I was then assigned down to the... Uh, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, again, the Infantry Battalion. That's where I, again, became a company commander. By then, I was a captain, uh, and I joined them in a, their base, which was in a, a place called Anwa, uh, which was well uh, west of Da Nang. Uh, and so I joined my, my unit there, and we had been stationed at Anwa. And we deployed from, and we had operations there, and we, because uh, the battalion had been there for almost a year. Uh, and then we were deployed to go up to uh, Fubai, Wei Fubai area. And that was all part of the bigger strategic plan of Fubai. And uh, we went out, we left, you know, they were all wired with barbed wire stuff around. We left the, the perimeter at about midnight on the, on the uh, evening of the 30th, we went out a mile or so on the hills and dug in. And, and as it turned out, we watched the, mortar, the rocket fires from out there into the base. But we, uh, my role there was to be able, to, if we spotted any of that or any enemy troop movements, you know, report it back. Uh, so we didn't have much. There were some rocket rounds that came in. And then we were back into the, came back into base camp there at first light on the 31st. So we came back into uh, Fubai. Now, uh, the, the Tet throughout the country had started, but nobody had any kind of feel for the enormity of that at all. And so we came back in, uh, kind of dropped our packs on the ground, told the uh, troops to go to breakfast. Um, I got called away to uh, operations center and say, well, you're going to have to stand by. It looks like you may be going somewhere. Um, I met uh, a, a lieutenant colonel who was a battalion commander, Mark Gravel, of 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. Shook his hand, and that's the first time we'd ever seen each other. And all he could say was, Chuck, we're going away. Get on the trucks, basically. So when they came back, we loaded up the trucks. We were only going to be gone for the afternoon. Our real mission was to go up into Way uh, through the uh, MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam compound, en route to escort the, the uh, Arvin Commanding General, their 1st Marines uh, Division, back to Fubai. 
Now, for what reason, why wasn't my business? They were going to come back, I assume, for some kind of briefing or some overview. But we were to provide uh, protection for the general when they we would come back in our vehicles. We went up in trucks. So that was our introduction to Tet, was now on the 31st of January. And when we left, uh, we got in our trucks. We left about oh, somewhere around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, Fubai to Wei is only about 7 miles, something like that. So it's not really that far. Um, and we made our entry into the city. Uh, never been in the city before. Never been in any kind of what we would call a big built-up area, city-type things. We'd all operated out in the rice paddy areas. But the thing we noticed in going in there was how quiet everything was. There weren't people on the side of the roads. There was no bustle of movement the closer we got to the city. And even more striking, there were no chickens. There were no chickens on the road running around like we'd normally see. So it gave you a pause to think, hmm, something's, something's going on here, but I don't know what that is. So we made our entry into the, into the, into the southern side of Hue, and we got to the first major intersection there, and we came under heavy enemy fire, machine gun automatic weapons, RPGs, rocket propelled grenades, that sort of thing. So that's when we actually say we've entered into something we had no idea would be happening. So, um, so you were telling me that your unit and you didn't even know there was a battle in Hawaii before you entered uh, Yes, but information we had back was uh, another rifle company had preceded us by an hour or so, and they had run into a lot of problems and had received enemy fire and had been under contact. But nobody, uh, we didn't piece that together. It, it wasn't why or who's doing it. I didn't understand. The units in the MACV compound had been under attack the night before, uh, had r radioed back their uh, condition, but. Uh, in, in reality, it really wasn't comprehended. It, Tet in Vietnam all over couldn't happen. Nobody was prepared for that. So we knew something was going on, but we didn't know the severity of what was going on. We did know that a Marine unit in front of us had taken enemy fire. Well, for us, we'd done that before, so it, we didn't know what, how big a deal that was. And so when we got into the city, we then found that out. And that's the first time we also found out that the uh, guys shooting at us wore uh, real uniforms. They were regular North Vietnamese Army soldiers. Had pith helmets on, their khaki kind of uniforms. But that was a, a real soldier, not went to the, the VC, that sort of thing. Uh, so when we, we made our entry into the city, we got, we were on trucks, but we had to dismount out of the trucks. And we proceeded uh, uh, up Highway 1 and made contact into uh, MACV compound. And all along there, there were destroyed vehicles, a couple of tanks, uh, South Vietnamese tanks had been destroyed. So you know that, and people, a lot of people shooting at us. So you know that, hey, something big's going on here. We got to the, our, the MACV compound, and again, trying to, who, who, what's the, who's the enemy? What is happening here? And again, it wasn't fully comprehended. There was no intelligence from uh, higher headquarters coming our way. And to the contrary, we got there, and the mission we were then given was to continue on. Continue on now to that compound where the Arvin General was to, to, to help continue your mission. Well, by now we would, were on foot. We had no vehicles. Um, and so this is where my company, Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th uh, Marines, were the ones tagged with going uh, to proceed up to this Arvin Division headquarters. Well, in the city of Way, the river that runs through the Perfume River is what it's called, uh, there was a, a vehicular bridge, big bridge over that, Route 1. 
So the only way we could make entry into the citadel side of way was over this bridge. Um, and that's, we were told, go over there. So uh, the company, I, w I entered way with about, 100 and, about 160 people. And we uh, only took two platoons with us as we went over the bridge. Had to provide security the other side of the bridge. And as we moved over the bridge, we came under, again, very intense uh, automatic weapon fire, machine gun fire, uh, uh, rock RPGs again. Uh, enemy were in facilities, buildings on the other end. And it was very, very intense. But we did make it over the bridge with the help of a couple of young guys that did very heroic stuff. And we, we did secure the bridge and get to the other side. But that's where we started taking our first casualties. And uh, we knew how, I, I had no maps. We did not have maps were provided us. The maps we had were like what we would call one to 50,000 map. So Way City was about this big. You can't maneuver through a town and understand that with some map like that. But we were given directions of how to get there. Uh, so we continued on, and as we fought our way down there, we came to, it was only a, a, about a large Vietnamese block. We were going to turn right and go up a street, and then there's a, one of the entrances through the citadel walls that we were going to go through and then proceed on. Well, we got to that corner, and then we were even under more intense uh, fire, and we were taking uh, m many more casualties. Um, and we didn't have we, the rules of engagement at that time where we could not uh, fire anything larger than small arms or 60 mortars, millimeter mortars. Could not use artillery, could not use air support. So we were, uh, shall we just say, badly outgunned. And we couldn't use the, the weapon systems that we had. Uh, we got to the corner and it just became. Uh, very, very intense in that. And that first afternoon, um, of that 160 guys, I had 50. I lost 50 uh, killed and wounded. We had seven killed and about 45 wounded. Well, that pretty much renders that rifle company fairly ineffective to begin with. So, um, and we, we couldn't turn off the road to get there. And to get into the Citadel, you had to go over another little bridge, but it was over a moat. The North Vietnamese were manning the tops, the moat, the top of the moat over the, the on the citadel. They were entrenched uh, in the in the buildings, we now know, and it, we just did not have the forces to do that. So the decision was made that we should move back where we came from, back over the bridge and consolidate ourselves back at that MACV compound. And so we got back there about, I want to say, 5.30, 6 o'clock at night. So that was a pretty tough afternoon. Well, the rules of engagement that are made from higher headquarters. The biggest reason that I, I have been told was the fact of the, uh, the cultural history of Hue. We're not going to shoot up those buildings, that, the, the you know, cultural center. And we were told it was like, like us trying to go in and shoot up the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, those kind of facilities, very revered by the Vietnamese people. So not knowing what was happening in there, the higher headquarters restricted us on what kind of weapon systems we could have. And it took three or four days before it was finally um, fully accepted as to what we were involved with and that those weapon systems could be used. But they still could not be used inside, inside the citadel in the imperial city where the, the, historically the kings lived and that, that, that. Those were still off limits for South Vietnamese forces or American forces to use uh, our firepower in there. So you Battlefield, you cannot use a weapon, and you don't know where the next part you go. Was it you listen to the radio and they instruct you where to go and 
what was your feeling at that time, at that moment? So we received some orders that were uh, not tactically very sound, but we tried to do that. Uh, the MACV, we had, again, some small maps that we might say where to go, but we, it, we couldn't get ourselves across the city block, across the street out of the MACV compound. We were under that much uh, heavy uh, enemy fire. The folks were as close as... Uh, you know, for me to the doors over there, you could see them across the streets. Um, so what did you see when they're talking about the bridge, and I believe that called Jungte Bridge, it, you know, connect uh, at the south and the north of Korea, and not far to where you cross the bridge and come back. It's about probably a quarter of a mile. There was the church called Fuka, and people were slaughtering there. Did you know anything about that, or you see anything about that? Oh, you mean the, the civilian casualties? No, we crossed the Fukam Canal at Anku. Uh, was the market area, but Anku is a little village area there. Um, at that time, the answer would have been no. We had no idea what was uh, happening, what the civilian population was, where they were. All we could basically tell, we didn't see anybody. So there, there weren't people around us, but where they were, what they did, we had no real idea. It took us probably, you know, again, three or four or five days before we got more information about that. And it took us probably, um, I'd say at least five days to a week before we cleared that southern side of the of Hui where a lot of that population started to come back in. They all left the city, basically, or hid in the attic, or, but we just didn't see them. And as we would clear areas further in there, the people would start coming back. And they came back, in, in some cases, just you know onesies, twosies, just a few, and then all of a sudden it would be 12 or 20, and then 50 and 100. Um, so that's when we encountered if you will, the, the Vietnamese civilians from away. But uh, we didn't hear about any of the um, any of the massacres or the atrocities about the, the civilian population till um, after the fact, you know, when we'd been in there. I can tell you that we found we found some uh, in the streets, but those are small numbers. Uh, we, I know we had met a couple of the, uh, uh, the Catholic religion is also okay, has been a big part in Vietnam. Maybe 20% of the population were Catholics. And so there was a Catholic cathedral there, there was a monastery was there, and a, a fair amount of the civilian population, I would say in a way, was Catholic. Um, so we had encountered a couple of the Catholic priests, and they were trying to provide us aid assistance to their flock, to the civilians, their folks there. Well, as it turned out, we, uh, in, a, in a week, ten days there, we uh, uncovered both of the priests who'd been murdered, hands behind them, throat slit, uh, mainly because they had been helping them. Uh, even more so was after the major efforts in fighting there, you found out, uh, we know that there were uh, a list, we, I'd call it a hit list, but a list that the uh, North Vietnamese had prepared for their folks to uh, target and basically assassinate. And they were uh, the politicians, they were the teachers, University of Way was there. They were uh, prominent civilians, prominent businessmen, um, doctors, lawyers, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and as an aside here, I have a list like that in my room there. I'll show it to you. So you actually saw that list from your I have that, a, a list. You had the list now. Now, yeah. Okay, so let's that long yeah. for the future generation. So, so we saw that, and then the, the, the 
really bad side of that was after we had pretty much cleaned up way. So now we're in the tail end of February. I was, we were in way for 40 days in that encounter. Um, afterward, we then started doing some maneuvers outside the city. And it was outside the city where the mass graves were found, uh, where we found one of those. And in the, one of those, we estimate there were 3,000 civilians in that. So um, you said that uh, you s there was some priests helping the troops, your troops, and then later they got killed. So the massacre were going on Why why you were there with the troops. Yes, they, they were, but not unknown to us. We would not have known that. Uh, and we would only found out as we would maybe go through an area and if they had killed any of the, again, the, the Vietnamese civilians in the city, we would find them. Or uh, some would be, but typically, if they could, their families would take, get them away or they would have buried them right in the yard and come back and found them, that sort of thing. But yes, we found a number of civilians. Earlier you mentioned about Phu Cam, there is a church for that uh, neighborhood in Phu Cam, and the priest, there was murder as well as many order of, uh, you know, citizens there. Uh, and then you were there, and you, once again, you didn't, you didn't know anything about that. Uh, we, we didn't know about the, again, the complexity, the severity, the, how big that effort was. We, we w did not know that. So later, now, uh, there, uh, there is a historian from the North, from the North Vietnamese, I mean, from the communists. Now, he's saying that you, you count over 3,000 people were killed at that time, but uh, on other people, and count about over 5,000. And they blame that Americans killed those. What do you have to say about that? Well, to me, that's typical at the time. That's North Vietnamese propaganda. It sounds good, but no. Americans didn't, we didn't encounter civilians. We're, but again, were civilians ever killed because of us clearing areas? Certainly. I'm sure there were. Was it, quote, intentional? That was our target? No. But that happens. But in, in that size of numbers would be uh, absolutely no way that would have, would have occurred. You mentioned the, uh, the Fukam, the Fukam Cathedral, which is a, still there today, a very nice Catholic church. We've been there many times. But when we uncovered that, when we were cleaning that side of the city, uh, it, as it happened, Golf Company uh, was clearing that, and we came into, the, into that uh, church. Uh, when we went in the church, there were over over 3,000 people inside this church, which is big, but it's not that big. And that they had gone there to seek refuge because they figured, the, I'm sure that the fact it's a religious, that the North Vietnamese would not harm them there. And that was fairly accurate. They didn't really mess with them. But a lot of the civilians got into there and they stayed there. So when we got through there, we were, if you will, they were liberated and that group of people, now all of a sudden here's 3,000 people that could go home, basically, go back to where they were, but uh, got to feed them. Now you mentioned about the list you, you captured and now you still have it. Can you uh, tell where and uh, when during that time you found the list and who you think that yeah, well, the, the list I came on, I really didn't get that till years and years and years later. I, we didn't find it at that time. But in, uh, in the, uh, I, I've always, you know, typically kind of collected some of the stuff and have been a bit of a repository for a, a lot of the history from there because I've been very, very interested in that. And I was still on active duty at the time and this, list uh, became available to me, a a again, which I'll show you. Um, and, and again, that, to me, that's eye-opening because of the, as you'll see, the level of detail. Uh, as an example, 
if I wanted to take the, and on that list the guy who sold peanuts on the corner of this two streets, it was to that level of detail, it's how to find them. And I just went, wow, wow. Now, why they would pick on him, I don't know. But that was, I, I'm sure that that list or other lists had been captured somewhere by somebody at some time. But we, we didn't find that ourselves, no. I've just come into that. How do you know that yeah. Well, I think when you when you look at it, when you read it, you can tell that the description of who they're talking about is Doctor So and So, in the Way Hospital, So and So on this street, which are in Way. So that the description there certainly fit. Now, do I know if they in fact had been killed? No, I don't know that for sure. You mentioned about the uh, I don't know that. Uh, I'm assuming they were not. Otherwise, they would have been killed earlier on. I think that was there was this list that had been made, and part of the NVA's mission and job, they infiltrated the areas, and then when they commenced that operation, that a lot of these folks were the first ones that they would. Uh, attack. Now the NVA had no idea that the American forces would be coming in there. It was kind of a kind of a common sense that once they got in there shooting, that the uh, armed forces would come down and there would be some American forces. But always recall that the mission of Tet, the the strategy from the North was that they would in, come down here, and it was the people's familiar in the history with the Easter Offensive in, or the Tet of 72. Uh, most of the U.S. forces had gone, had been had come home, but the North uh, invaded into the South Vietnam a couple times, but the Easter Offensive of 72 was a real major event at the time. I have met the North Vietnamese Army Lieutenant who was the tank commander of the first tank to cross the Dong Ha Bridge retired uh, North Vietnamese colonel. I've met some others. I met a, an officer who was a retired major general who had been uh, an artillery commander in Quezon. They were physically in uh, Laos, but were shooting into Quezon. I, again, I look at that, and they were, were professional soldiers. So was I. So I, I, I have gotten through to be able to talk to them. Now, we don't, we're not talking about who's winning what or so, but typically for uh, veterans, you know, were you in the service? Yes. Where did you serve? That sort of thing. And so I have met them. I've also met um, in a little restaurant by the lagoon uh, south of Phu Bai uh, some North Vietnamese troops. They had been junior enlisted men during that time period who were coming from Hanoi down for a visit to the areas they had fought in, at the same time we're coming from America to go visit the areas we had fought in. So we all had a glass of beer and Huda beer. And, uh, again, for, for us to do that is, th there's no, no real animosity, I don't think, there. Because again, we're, but we were soldiers. We were professional military guys in doing that. Um, I have met uh, some of the, uh, you know, civilian folks who had lost relatives there. You know, obviously today they're grandmas, the older generation. But I have met some of the, had the opportunity to meet some. Uh, I've met some guys who were, uh, were VC. Met some women who were VC, um, but that's again that's a long time ago, and I think it's easier for uh, Americans to do that than it is for for Vietnamese to do that, because Vietnam's not my country, you know, and and we were sent there. I'm glad we went there, but th that emotional tie is not.
but here in the u s you know in the american history and well you guys from texas you know there are guys who still believe the south going to rise again and that discussing relatives and old family from our own internal civil war is just about as brutal can be but anyway yes i have i've met a number of them uh, uh what do you think about them i mean through the conversation <laughs> Well, sure. Um, our our discussions with them, we both agree that, and I would, that they were very good professional soldiers. They would agree that the Marines were very good professional soldiers. Um, their uh, rationale as to what they wanted to do, we, we, of course, did not agree with. But, again, that's fine. There's very different political stances on that sort of thing. But when you ask about that guy himself or what he was doing, again, as a professional soldier, uh, they had some. Ver they were very good at, at the stuff they did, and some of the plans they did. They just don't agree with what they were doing. Uh, so, um, in the history, and now they're still saying that um, America came to invade Vietnam. Uh, do you think, like that term? No, I certainly do not. I don't agree with that term at all. I, I'm one, in my opinion, that the United States involvement, and particularly the initial involvement in Vietnam, was quite well founded. I mean, we had a responsibility there. We, and it, when you invade a country, oftentimes you do that to keep it. The United States, in all the wars we fought, we have never fought a war where we kept any territory in which we have been fighting. Had a discussion there with a the French guy once, and the same thing, World War II, World 